deliverance. Be inspired on Liberty Radio. The service for me today was empowering. It was refreshing. What I understood is that when you prophesy, you see results in your life, especially when you prophesy based on the word of God, because the word of God is powerful. And when you manifest it, you'll see results, whether it's in your financial, spiritual, um, love life, wherever it is, you're going to see results. Basically, allow the will of God to be done in my life and let God's will be done over mine because that's what will bring me peace. Um, I tend to hurt myself when I want to do what I want to do. Um, and if I don't make decisions asking God first, it can be like a negative effect in the long run. So basically I learned mainly to just consult God before, ask God before any decision that I make, is this your will for me? And through that I'll be guided and I'll be directed to making the right choices. The most destructive thing that you can do in life is to do your own will. Sin comes from doing our own will. If we have our choice between sin and no sin, our choice will nine times out of 10, not to say 10 times out of 10, our choice will be what? Sin. That is the will of man. God is expecting me and is expecting us to do His will. Because to do the will of God brings peace. It's not easy to do the will of God, but to do the will of God brings peace. It's easy to do my will. It's easy for you to do your will, but doing your will doesn't bring peace. And if you look at all the problems you've had, not all, but the majority of problems you've had, perhaps you've had them because you did whose will? It was our own will. What I got from the message was that the will of God gives peace. Sometimes you think that doing our will will make us happy, but it's doing the will of God that gives that true peace. And so I need to make sure that I'm doing the will of God and I find the will of God in the word of God. You have to persevere because God said, my just shall live by faith. So sometimes you may pray, you may fast, you may do many purposes, but you may not see results straight away. But that doesn't mean that you need to stop. That means that you need to keep persevering. Now, earlier, we ministered, we prophesied healing in many things. But now I prophesy the Spirit of God entering your life. I prophesy that you who saw no value in your life. Maybe you looked at your life and you saw it in your mind. You saw it like a, an old crumpled up piece of paper that no one wanted anymore, that had no value. But I prophesy that you understand the value you have in the eyes of the Lord Jesus. I prophesy that you understand that he wants to make everything new in your life. Good evening, everyone. May God bless you abundantly in the name of the Lord Jesus. Yesterday, Monday, I wanted to be connected with you there from our church in Swindon. Unfortunately, we had some technical problems and I couldn't. But we're here now. And this whole week is very special because we are gearing up for Sunday, a day that we call the, the day, the Sunday of living life in color. In a few moments, we're going to tell you why. I'll tell you why myself and Pastor John, who's here with me, that you'll get to see in a moment. We're both wearing this polo uh, of our Beat Depression group that we have in the church. And later on, towards the end of the program, stick with us because after the prayer, we're going to find out the second thing about Judas Iscariot that showed us that he had an evil force, an evil spirit in his life all along. Today we're going to look at the second sign of this. But first, since tomorrow is a special Wednesday, as we are going to be taking part of the Lord's Supper, here's a taster of what will happen tomorrow in the church. Mm -hmm. 
This is the ceremony where we remember the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus for each one of us. It is the moment, with the bread and the cup in our hands, that we renew our vows of faithfulness in this life to inherit eternity in the kingdom of heaven. The table is already prepared for you before the altar to drink of the cup of the new and eternal covenant, the cup of salvation. This Wednesday, we shall have the Lord's Supper of the Kingdom of Heaven at 7.30 p.m. at 232 Seven Sisters Road, Finsbury Park, London, N4 3NX or at your nearest Universal Church. One of the ways that people with depression explain or try to make someone with, without struggling with depression understand what it's like to live with depression is that they usually say that they feel like they're living life in black and white with no color. We often get people saying that uh, there was a, a nurse actually, uh, a member of our church, who was explaining how she overcame depression. She was saying that when she was depressed, she often felt that the patients she looked after that were in excruciating pain were better off than her that had no physical pain but had a tremendous pain in the soul. And she said she often wanted, if she could at that time, before being free, she often wanted to trade places with that person who was in a physical excruciating pain because she knew as a nurse that at least for the physical pain, there was some kind of relief because she said for her, with the, the pain of being in depression, she said, I felt like there was nothing that could release or relieve me of my pain. And I was thinking earlier, we often have people giving testimony here in this program and in the church. And in a few moments, you're going to watch another testimony. But people who say, I suffered with depression. But then we ask, were you ever diagnosed with depression? And the person says, no. So then I was thinking, either this person is over-exaggerating what happened to her, she was just a little bit sad, and she's labeling that as depression, and I believe many people make that same assumption or that same judgment. So I thought either that happened, or the number of people with depression is extremely, extremely underreported. And I was doing some digging up today, and look what I came across. There was an article that I read that said that 80 to 90 percent of people living with depression in low and middle income countries are not diagnosed or treated. Think about that for a second. Now, it doesn't mean that 80 or 90 percent of the population has depression. That's not what it's saying. It's saying that the vast majority of people living with depression never have depression diagnosed. Because if you think about it, a lot of people think that depression is not a case to go to the doctors. In fact, people think, why should I go to the doctor to tell him that I'm sad? But actually, in many cases, it's worse than sadness. It's like we said here many times in this program, it's a gaping hole, wound inside of them that is, is killing them. And, and that's why there are people who, because of depression, they, they attempt to take their own lives. But these are people, in fact, the vast majority of people who struggle with depression have never had this diagnosed by a doctor just for the simple reason that they've never been to a doctor with this problem. But that doesn't mean that they don't have this issue. And that's why we see many people in the church who give testimonies, like the one of Yolanda that you're going to see now, that they state, I struggled with depression, I suffered with depression, but they never had this depression diagnosed by a doctor. It doesn't mean that they didn't have it. 
And I want to say to you that if you stumbled upon this program, someone invited you to watch this program, and you're struggling with depression, but you've never had this diagnosed by a doctor, I know that you are not, you know, finding excuses not to get out of the house or not to go to work. I know that this is a real problem because we see people coming to the church all the time with these issues. But I also know that there's a solution for you. Let's watch Yolanda's testimony. Testimony. When we come back, we'll be speaking to Pastor John, who's here in the studio with us. Even since I was a child, um, I've always felt uh, very sad. I didn't fit in on with anyone, like with my family, with friends. I always tried to be uh, someone else. I had no purpose in life. I was really, really sad. I was desperate. I was searching for answers everywhere. I was looking for to, for someone to help. Then I just, I just got really, really depressed. At home, it was like I was always by myself because every time, everyone, my mom, my brother was always locked in their rooms. With my friends at school, I, I had friends, popular friends, and they used to go out, but I didn't like it, but I would still do it just to, um, just to please everyone, just to have, just to not be at home. Even when I came to England as well, um, I came with um, my ex-partner, the father of my child, and I was always by myself at home because everybody would go to work. And uh, I was just always crying, always, I remember always with a knot on my throat, always like feeling so miserable. Then uh, when I got into the second relationship, um, things just started to go even worse. Um, I had, we had so many problems, so many fights. And then my son, I had to send him to Spain because um, I couldn't deal with everything that was happening to me with the debts, the, the, the depression. I even went to a doctor to ask if there was anything that I could take because it was I was suffering inside so much. That happened when I when I went to the hospital mostly because I took so much medication. I took absolutely everything that I had in the house and that's when they started treating me for depression. I had a friend at work, she was my manager. Uh, she started speaking to me a lot about the Universal Church, she even started to come to my house to be more with me to speak to me about um, about faith. One day uh, I was I was on the bus. I was in a bad, a really bad state. I saw a Brixton branch. I said, "Let me get let me get off and go there and see." And that's how I started to come. I I just pour out. <laughs> I just I just cried a lot that day with the pastor. The pastor sat down with me. He was very kind. I found it very supportive. And I sat, we sat down for about an hour talking about my problems. But I felt so good when I left. That night, I slept the whole night and from then on. So I kept coming every single day during the week at seven o'clock in the morning. I kept coming to the Universal Church until I heard about the Holy Spirit. When I heard about the Holy Spirit, I said, this is what I need. Whatever I do, God is going to be inside of me telling me what to do. Because otherwise, in any moment, I could just drop again. One day on a Wednesday evening in the service, he, he came. I was so happy. He was always there. I felt so confident from then on. Yolanda today is totally different. He's happy from inside. I don't have to pretend that I'm happy. I don't have to pretend to put a smile on my face, a fake smile on my face. I don't. I'm happily married. Uh, my husband comes to the Universal Church. We met here in the Universal Church. He's a lovely man, a man of God. I am very united with my children as well. I was never able to finish any education, but now I have my qualifications. I have my company. Everything is going well. I have a stable life. I don't have debts. I, I can live a good life. I don't know how people can live without the Holy Spirit, without God inside of them. For me, the main verse in the Bible is seek the kingdom of God first and everything will be added. That's what happened in my life. I do not seek anything else. I seek God. I know my life is gonna be okay because he's taking care of it. I just wish I found him earlier because I will avoid a lot of suffering, a lot of mistakes, a lot of regrets.
I'm happy now. You see that Yolanda said that she had been diagnosed with depression. But from the statistics we saw today, she is a minority. She's a, a very, very small minority. She only makes, from the statistics we read earlier, between 20 to 25 percent of the people who really struggle with depression. The other 80, 75 percent, they, they are struggling with this depression without ha ever having been told that this is a problem. But in the end, we know that there is no pill, no tablet that can make that pain in the soul to disappear. Because if you are in pain, if you, if you ever had a headache, uh, a pain somewhere, you took a painkiller and most likely that dealt with your pain. But Pastor John, we know that people struggling with depression it's very difficult and, and sometimes professionals want to help them and their help is important, but we know this happens in the soul and, and sometimes the person feels, the person who's dealing with depression feels powerless because they don't think, they don't feel like they can find an answer somewhere. And many people who are suffering with depression, they don't show the signs on the outside. This, is the, this is statistic, I am a living proof of that. I suffer with depression, but I have never been diagnosed with that because my family used to, to think I was just trying to uh, call for an audience for uh, uh, the tantrum that I was throwing. And how many they are being told by their family, by friends, they're just being sassy, they're just being fuzzy. It's not a, a big deal. But when they are alone in their room, when the effect of the alcohol, when the effect of the drugs is over, they have to deal with that, the holding inside of them. And Jesus has the cure for that. He can bring an end to that, as it was for my life, where I didn't find in the alcohol, what I didn't find on having pleasure with women, but I found in Christ, I found in Jesus. So there's a solution for that. But you also, am I right in, if I don't, my memory doesn't fail me, there was a time that you, you were, in the balcony about to throw yourself from the balcony when someone called you to invite you to the church is that how what happened yes which was uh, actually my, my, the when, when i hit rock bottom was when the the alcohol when the pleasures of the flesh when the friends when nothing else could cover the hole that i was feeling so i was looking outside of the window of the eighth floor uh story building where my family lives until today i was contemplating so i'm just a burden to my family and just uh, a headache to others. How, how old were you at this time? I was around 17, Bishop. 17. And, you know, it's like you said, a lot of people think that when a 17-year-old boy or girl is saying, look, I'm struggling, they think they're trying to get attention to themselves. But this was very much a real problem for you. And we see that there are young people who, unfortunately, because of depression, attempt to take their lives. Unfortunately, some of them succeed. You were not trying to get attention to yourself. This, is, this was a real problem. Not at all. And unfortunately, Bishop, no one could say that I was depressed because I was smiley. I had always people around me, but all in an attempt on trying to hide the suffering, to hide the sadness, because I would cry myself to sleep. I would have no peace. I, to the point on that Sunday that I was really contemplating, was about to jump off the balcony of the flat where my family lives. What happened? Someone sent you a text? Yes. Someone for two years had been fighting for me, contacting me, speaking about the church, about Jesus. But in my pride, in my arrogance, I thought I didn't need that. But that one night, they sent you a text at the right time? It was a, 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 an afternoon, and the text was saying, I know you didn't attend the 10 a.m. service this Sunday. However, there's still a 6 p.m. service. What do you have to lose? Pastor John, let me, let me stop you there. I want to do something right now. I want you to do the same thing. What was the name of the person who sent you that text? Larissa. Larissa. I want you to do the same thing that Larissa did that day with Pastor John. Imagine. I don't know if our production team, we were going to say a prayer now. We're going to keep the prayer for the end. I don't know if you can prepare uh, a song or I don't know if we have any video we're going to play. We're going to play a video here for two minutes. I don't know. We'll find something to play there. 
because we weren't planning to do this. And I believe we are being led by the Holy Spirit. But I want you to do the same thing that Larissa did. And I want you to pick up the phone. Perhaps you already have your phone on your hands because you're watching this program. Whether you're an assistant, a member, uh, a person who just stumbled across this program. And I want you to send a text now, whether via text, WhatsApp, Telegram, Messenger, you name it, uh, Instagram, direct messages. Send a message to that person to say, I was thinking about you and I want you to come to the church with me on Sunday. So whatever branch you attend, we're, we're going to... Do we have the... How long is the, the video, Pastor? We're going to have one minute and 21. We're going to have almost two minutes. And I'd like you, during these two minutes, to send that text out to someone. You're going to formulate the text. You're going to say, look, I was thinking of you. And who knows? That text is going to reach... And we're going to, we're going to hear testimonies of people on Sunday in our churches who will say, listen, I was, I was at home and someone sent me a message and I came here and I was desperate. And thank God I came because I already feel different. You ready to do that now? Let's, let's everyone do that. I can't do that because my phone is on, it's switched off here in the studio, otherwise it might ring. But I'm going to do that later as well. And you, you do that now. Let's go. So one minute and 41 seconds while this video plays, let's go ahead and do that now. Constantly chasing someone who you can't see. It doesn't matter if I was having good grades, it was really good at sports, or I was successful in one or other way. The chase never was enough. You never felt peace. When the falling point came, I knew I cannot do it again. I knew that there is no, there is literally not a drop of energy or faith in myself or hope left. And I wanted just to end my life because I was done. I tried everything for years and years and there was nothing else left. My life today is completely changed. I don't feel suicidal anymore. I don't have panic attacks. I don't have insomnias. I don't have emotional or anger outbursts. I am more balanced. I'm more in a peace. Uh, I can fully function as a member of society and even help others. I'm really relieved that I'm set free from depression, from panic attacks, from insomnias, and I can be a balanced and happy person. Imagine you returning to life. Coming soon, an event to ignite your inner transformation. Life in Colour, on Sunday, 17th September at 10 a.m at 232 Seven Sisters Road, Finsbury Park, London, N4, 3NX, or at your nearest universal church. Did you do that? I hope you did, and if for some reason you didn't, immediately after we finished the program, do that, send a message to someone that the Holy Spirit reminded you now during the program. I received a message here uh, in the chat of Liberty Radio. Charlene from Bull Ring says like this, I was diagnosed with depression, anxiety, and low mood following a sexual assault about 30 years ago when I had started secondary school. I thought I had sur surpassed uh, the trauma uh, by not confronting it. Uh, but fear would come out in other unhealthy ways. Then I went through bullying at work, which is where my doctor prescribed me antidepressants and referred me to mental health services. Today I'm free, healed to the point, even the doctors were shocked and in disbelief at how much progress I made and how healed I was. To God be the glory, nothing is impossible for the God we serve. Charlene, may God bless you. This is it. You are an inspiration to people who are watching us now. We are going to say a prayer right now. Perhaps you have a family member, a friend who is struggling with depression. I'm going to ask Pastor John to say this prayer since he struggled with depression. And I thank God never did. But he knows that God can take away this depression that perhaps a family member of yours has. And we're going to pray for God to touch them so that you can bring them with you to the church this Sunday. And there, on the day of life in color, the pain that is in their, in their soul will cease to exist, will stop existing.
Let's pray. Let's talk to God right now. Let's talk to God. It's time to pray. My Lord and my Father, what were the odds of a text message saving my life on that day? You work against the odds. Nobody believed in me. I didn't believe in myself. But one servant of yours who was bold, courageous enough through that text message reached me out. And since that Sunday, I have never left your presence because on that first day, I had an encounter with peace. Depression vanished from me. The desire for dying vanished. And a true desire to live was born in me. Lord Jesus, visit now this person who has just received this text. My Lord, let you be the one who will speak to this person. Honor the faith of this listener who, through sending this text message, who reaching this person out, my Lord, who have done a great he has given a great gift to this person that will save their souls. My Lord, as that Sunday was the day of the total transformation in my life, my Lord, this Sunday, in every universal church in the UK, in the globe, my Lord, their souls will be transformed and depression will be over. My Father, we surrender this work in your hands and we rebuke every work of the devil, Satan, you've lost. Listen to us, you've lost these souls, you have lost these lives, and many souls will be added to the kingdom of God from today already, from tonight already, the decision will be made. It's what we determine by faith in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Praise God. We believe. Uh, a lot of people are sending messages here. Bishop, done, message sent. Amen. And we still have a couple of days to, to gather in the house of God this Sunday, those who are desperate. Now, here on this table, we have a packet of flour that we are blessing every day in the services here in Finsbury Park and grape juice. And this Friday, we are going to start the chain of prayer of the bread of revelation for God to reveal what is hidden. Have a look at this Bible verse here. We've been speaking about Judas, to whom Jesus gave the bread dipped in the grape juice. And it says like this, talking about the, the traitor, Jesus answered, it is he to whom I shall give a piece of bread when I have dipped it. And having dipped the bread, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. Now after the piece of bread, Satan entered him. Then Jesus said to him, what you do, do quickly. I just want to keep here in the screen this verse because this part of the verse, Satan entered him, is often misunderstood because in reality, Satan didn't enter into Judas in this moment. The evil that was in Judas was already there, but it just revealed itself in this moment. We could say it manifested itself in this moment. And we, every day this week, we are talking about signs that there was already an evil spirit in Judas. Yesterday, we spoke about him touching what was sacred. Today, what is the second sign? Well, we, we know that Judas was a traitor. And one of the qualities of a person who is of God is that they are faithful. After all, the Spirit of God is faithfulness, right? It's one of the things that qualifies or that describes rather those who are of God. So him being a traitor, some who, someone who was two-faced, who was one thing in front of the Lord Jesus and something else behind the Lord Jesus and everybody else, even though he couldn't deceive Jesus. Jesus knew who he was. That was a sign that there was an evil already there. Because after all, who is, who is the chief of deceit? <laughs> who is the chief of the traitors? Who, tra who betrayed, who was the first betrayer? of all times it was Lucifer. He is the chief, he is the master deception, the master of deception. 
Tomorrow we're going to look at the third sign that Judas already had an evil spirit there all along. And we'll be talking more about this. Friday, don't miss the chain of prayer of the bread of revelation starting for seven Fridays in all our churches. And here in Finsbury Park will be no different. All right. We'll be back tomorrow at the same time. Pastor John, thank you for coming. A pleasure. May God bless you. We'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye. This has been Be Inspired on Liberty Radio.